Good morning. Welcome. My name is Michael Riedeker. I'm the conference chair. And I would like to invite you all, representatives from the host institution, representatives from the Czech government, representatives from the Australian government, and representatives from the European Commission, and all dignitaries from different parts of Europe, and all the researchers here, I would like to welcome you to this conference. And without much uh, more, I would now like to hand over to Jan Topinka, the host here in the Czech Republic, who did an excellent job in making sure that we have here these beautiful rooms and that outside the poster session is arranged and everything. And I give now the word to Jan. Thank you, Michael, for a nice introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am very happy that uh, this conference uh, uh, is uh, finally held here because uh, I believe that it will uh, attract uh, many uh, top scientists uh, to cooperate uh, with the uh, Czech Republic in the area of nanotoxicology. We have our national program uh, in, in nanotoxicology, but uh, we believe, and uh, I am convinced now even more after these two days of uh, meeting that uh, without uh, effective cooperation within Europe uh, is uh, uh, impossible to do good science. Uh, uh, now I would like uh, to ask a representative of the Institute of Experimental Medicine who is hosting institute and uh, former chairman of uh, Grand Agency of the Czech Republic, uh, Professor Sika, uh, to give us a welcome word. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants of the Conference on Quality in Nano-Safety Assessment, Driving Best Practice and Innovation. It's an honor uh, and a pleasure for me to welcome you to the premises of the Academy uh, of Sciences in Prague. I have to apologize that the director of the Institute, Professor Eva Sikova, must be present now as a senator in the Senate of the Parliament of the Czech Republic. The Institute of Experimental Medicine, one of the institutes uh, of the Academy of Sciences of the Czech Republic, has been involved in ecotoxicological research for many years. This research is performed particularly in the, the Department of uh, Genetic Ecotoxicology and its laboratory of genetic toxicology led by Dr. Jan Topinka. The major scientific interest in this laboratory is oriented towards the study of the genotoxic effects of xenobiotics and oxidative damage to DNA, proteins, and lipids. The Institute of Experimental Medicine, which has approximately 150 employees, performs research in uh, several scientific fields, uh, such as uh, cellular and sensory neuroscience, regenerative medicine, the molecular biology of cancer, teratology, and others. The biomedical campus of the Academy of Sciences in Kretsch, where you are now, comprises four other research institutes besides the Institute of Experimental Medicine. Uh, these are the Institute of Molecular Genetics. This is building here, uh, belongs to the institute. The Institute of Microbiology, the Institute of Physiology, and the Institute of Biotechnology. And thus it represents a major institution for biomedical research in the Academy of Sciences. Altogether, the Koch Institutes employ more than 1,000 employees. The financing of research in the Czech Republic is based on a grant system with two major distributors of grants, the Czech Science Foundation, or Grantová agentura České republiky, for basic research, and the Technology Agency of the Czech Republic for applied research. The Czech government invests approximately 26 billion Czech crowns a year into research and development, 
which is a little bit more than 1 billion euro. Expressed as a percentage of GDP, the government expenditures equal almost 0.7%, while total spending on R&D in the Czech Republic, uh, this is including the private sector, equals 1.8%. A substantial part of the state investment represents financing from EU structural funds, which are spent mostly on building new research institutes. Our involvement in European collaboration is very strong at the present time within the seventh framework program. For example, research in teams of the Institute of Experimental Medicine have participated in many projects of the European Union during the last several years, such as Axe-Region, Nano-Ear, Interis, Eduglia, Marie Curie projects, and others. Exposures to airborne nano-sized particles have been experienced by humans throughout the revolution, but it is only with the advent of the Industrial Revolution that such exposures have increased dramatically because of anthropogenic sources such as internal combustion engines, power plants, and many other sources of uh, thermodegradation. The rapidly developing field of nanotechnology has become another source for human exposure to engineered nanoparticles by different routes through inhalation, ingestion, skin penetration, and injection into blood circulation. The characteristic biokinetic behaviors of nanoparticles represent attractive qualities for promising applications in medicine as diagnostic and therapeutic devices. Nanoparticles are used for targeted drug delivery to tissues that are difficult to reach, for example, the central nervous system or the inner ear. In the fight uh, against cancer, as intravascular nanosensor and nanorobotic devices, etc. The same properties that make nanoparticles so attractive for use of in nanomedicine and for specific industrial processes could also prove to be deleterious when nanoparticles interact with living cells. Evaluating the safety of nanoparticles should be of the highest priority given their expected worldwide distribution for industrial applications and the likelihood of human exposure. Nanotoxicology, which can be defined as the science of engineered nanodevices and nanostructures that deals with their effects in living organisms, is gaining increased attention. Nanotoxic nanotoxicology research not only provides data for safety evaluation of engineered nanostructures and devices, but also will help to advance the field of nanomedicine by providing information about their undesirable properties and means to avoid them. Research in nanotoxicology has a full support of the leadership of the Institute of Experimental Medicine. We are very pleased to host this conference on the premises of the Academy of Sciences of the Czech Republic. Saying this, I would like to finish my talk by expressing my best wishes for the success of the second quality nano-integrating conference, as well as for your successful and pleasant stay in Prague. Thank you. Thank you very much for this overview on uh, the Czechoslovak, uh, on the Czech research scene. Sorry, I'm still in, my, in the old times. <laughs> and it's now my pleasure to announce Georgios Katalagarianakis from the European Commission. He's uh, strongly involved in defining the Horizon 2020 activities uh, in the nano safety and health field. And he is also um, a strong supporter of the nano safety cluster. George. Thank you, Michael. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, please allow myself to express my personal pleasure for being here in Prague and in this uh, 
nice uh, building and, and amphitheater for, for the second time. Of course, uh, a bit more than a couple of years ago, we have had another um, nano safety oriented uh, meeting here. And uh, above all, uh, I must go welcome on behalf of the European Commission, who is the funding authority behind this quality nano infrastructure program. And, and many thanks for, for the honor to open the, um, to, to, to include my speech in the opening uh, session. I will try and find out maybe I need to press here to open my slides. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, going uh, quite quickly, quickly and, and, and simplifying, trying to simplify a quite complex field with a lot of um, application areas and a lot of uh, disciplines involved. I will say a couple of words for Horizon 2020 uh, because this practically changes now every day. Then uh, go further with the overall scientific vision, give you a snapshot of the current situation and uh, talk about the strategy for the future. So in some, area, in some slides I will go very fast. Please use them as reference for further, um, uh, further investigation, uh, if you wish. So Horizon 2020 is practically the next uh, framework program. We don't call it framework program eight as, uh, as the number it would go. The name is now Horizon 2020. Uh, the basic lines are practically the same, not precisely. So the knowledge-based innovation, knowledge-based economy is again at the center. Sustainability, again, the center, you know this all since maybe more than 15 years. And uh, what is new there is the inclusive uh, growth. We want there uh, to pay attention to, 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 to employment for all and, and delivering uh, cohesion in the European Union. So the innovation union, uh, that, that, that is a term which comprises a number of programs going from basic research to investment for new industry. So the whole thing, um, which is administered by several um, directorate generals of the European Commission, but also by national governments. The, the, the aim is to make all this a logical ensemble, a logical set of uh, political activities. So the, um, uh, the, the aim to get good ideas to the market uh, is something we all need to pursue. And by all, I mean from the authorities, uh, European Union and governments, to uh, regional governments and, and uh, industrial research, uh, industrial companies or research institutions. Going a bit more in focus, uh, what Horizon 2020 will have is the first set, which are, is called the Key Enabling Technologies, and there are six of them. And a number of focus areas, which I don't include here, not because they are not interested, but then I would extend too much. So focusing on the Key Enabling Technologies, we see that uh, three elements of that, the nanotechnology advanced materials, and advanced manufacturing systems nowadays comprise what we call the industrial technologies. Of course, not only those are in the industrial technologies programs, the NMB, as was the name in FP7, uh, but, um, and then we need to add a number of PPPs, in particular the car industry, the buildings, and the factories of the future. But this is a different, uh, a different element that um, will be a subset of these key enabling technologies. Uh, what is the situation now? And I say this because uh, it changes every day. Uh, we are now in elaborating uh, priorities for the first year. We hope to complete this uh, probably before the summer holidays. You know, summer holidays is a major milestone in the commission administration, so a, a major deadline. And. Uh, if this is completed, then we will make a pre-announcement of what is going to be published. And of course, this cannot be published uh, before the, the European Council and the European Parliament decide together on, uh, on, on this package. 
this we expect to happen after the holidays, so maybe by October we are in position to publish, and then the deadline will be really very short, so it will be December. And uh, we can do that because we shall have proceeded with um, the pre-announcement. So uh, organize yourselves, it's, um, it will be hot. A vision, therefore. Going further in focus, nanotechnologies, uh, we are there active on a number of uh, what we call uh, technology readiness levels, these DRLs. This is practically the basic research. This is the application focus area, and these are the showcases. So as you see, the complete makes a logical ensemble is, is uh, in elaboration inside the NanoFusion platform, for which I will, sh I will tell you a bit later. And uh, we hope that inside this, uh, safety, but not only safety, but societal dimensions, societal aspects, will be included. Okay, this is um, just in a single slide, how we see this to uh, continue. What is the current situation? I go very fast now and focus only on a number of, uh, of um, projects uh, because uh, that would be too long. So this uh, is the beginning of FP7. We have another a number of projects, FP6, before that. That's the second call. These projects are most like, uh, mostly finishing now, and this was the beginning of the activity of the cluster. Here we have some projects now which are in their second or third year, or some of them completed. In particular, uh, we have some first action here on food, uh, the, the Nanolyze project, and some of these uh, projects it's worth uh, looking and looking at their websites. We have the, a number of large projects. We have just been, uh, we just uh, uh, started a, a year or nine and a half year ago, the Marina Nano Valid modeling. We have the national, um, nationally supported uh, projects, uh, CEIN. They have already made a call for proposals and they expect to publish a second call this year, so link with them. And QNano at first, this is an old slide, it's the old name, I need to adapt that. That was the infrastructure. So it, it is already four, maybe five years that uh, we thought, uh, yeah, we need to do something to get all these institutes together because they need to start talking with each other and fine-tune their work, communicating, comparing, benchmarking. But above all, these institutes are there to attract young scientists. It's a growing field. The message is clear. We need human potential. So this is a call for the youth, young scientists, come and join. You will be in one institute, but not really in one institute. You will be in one institute network with a number of other institutes, and there is really a lot of work to be done, and most of it very, very challenging. So, QNano at start, Quality Nano now, uh, Quality Nano now uh, is playing this role, and we want to facilitate it further in, in, in the future. There has been a lot done, but there is even more remaining, so Quality Nano will answer this challenge. Anyhow, the whole conference turns around this objective. Don't forget that. Next, we have some projects which have been launched last year. Some of them are quite uh, long-term looking, ITS Nano. Some of them looking uh, more closer to the SMEs um, question, uh, like, like those, and some of them more to the workers situation um, and, and, and work conditions in the nano industry. Then we have some other um, lighthouse projects which uh, are now starting. So Nano Mile starts in a couple of days from now, 1st of March. And Nano Solution a month later, 1st of April. 
the five modeling projects that you see here, they are also ab about to start. And now here we make the first hesitant steps into the regulatory domain, which is a new item. This is a joint project, is a close to 50 million project, uh, financed mainly by the member states' governments, about 30 million, by the European Union, 10 million, by, it's again member states' governments, taxpayers' money, and by the industry, industry it's also consumers' money, um, by 10 million. So this is, um, is, is put in place to cover the area below the research, the, the regulatory element. That means how the authorities and the industries understand each other. And of course, nanostairs, which is um, an action to support standardization. So all this means that uh, we are in a growing domain. Don't be misled by this, uh, by this here, because it's not really one year. Uh, we changed financial, uh, financial uh, rules at that time, and each of these bullets is really two-thirds of a year. So the funding did not really drop there. Um, it was more or less in the same, uh, in the same area. And we go with something around 30 million per year. And of course, there we need to add the national activity, which is not uh, included. For all these, uh, there is the nano safety cluster um, organized, and I will not say much about that. Uh, it's worth uh, going into the website and, and see it. it. It started small, it continues to grow, and next June, they are coming with their strategic research agenda and a major activity with international cooperation. I will say a word about that a bit later. That's the structure, but again, not, it's not my, the purpose now to analyze all this. In, in, and let's come what is the closing phase of um, FP7. So the proposals are being written still, they have to be submitted and compete and selected. So there we expect to have a number of projects in the production domain, so administration of safety in the production domain. We have to organize uh, what will be the basis for what uh, is called the bioinformatics, so IT um, technology for um, management of safety. The next generations of nanomaterials, which is a big challenge because until now we are still struggling with the first generation, the passive nanomaterials, but what happens with the others? So there we expect a major um, foundation rather project, so something to build upon in the future. And of course, again, a little bit on the regulatory domain, but not precisely, new technology that will allow the implementation of, of uh, the Commission recommendation for a definition of nanomaterials. So we, uh, we shall finalize this selection around the month of May, and uh, we expect to go very quickly and commit the money and start the projects uh, before the end of the year. Anyhow, commit the money before the end of the year. The project can start beginning 2014. Strategy. I will not analyze again all this in, in saving the time. Uh, on RTD level, we have done great progress. If one looks about the areas where a bit less progress has been achieved, one would spot probably the ecotoxicity, which has taken some delay, the monitoring, but they advance fast. The non-clear metrics, uh, number mass or surface, for, 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 for these metrics there might be changes after all. And we need to uh, mark advance on these, on these um, elements. 
when we come a bit lower, so once we can calculate the risk and then we examine if the risk is acceptable or not, then risk evaluation and risk communication, ensuring risk reduction technologies need to be supported. On the regulatory level, still three minutes? Okay. On the regulatory level, then we need the need, we see the need for uh, convincing and agreeable data sets in order to go further with everything else. And go with a general understanding about the best practice guys, guides. We, we start having some of those already. So the NanoReg project, as I said earlier, is there to cover this. So I have given already this information. And when we go lower on the market level, then all these points have a question mark at the end. So what happens about the laboratories networks, the benchmarking, certification, skills, standardization? So all these items have to be addressed. So what do we do? Uh, probably we need a strategy. When the moment you start spending a considerable amount of money, okay, you can do it without strategy. But if you do it with a strategy, that's, that value is, is maximized. So we are busy with this. You're mostly invited to come and join the discussion. And the aim, the shape of this is, what I said, a document, strategic research agenda, a draft has been circulated and uh, is now the elaboration process. Mostly welcome to come and assist. In the international cooperation that I mentioned already, the principal players, the United States and the European Union, not, not of course, to, to undervalue the other, uh, the other countries, like, like uh, okay, we'll not mention them all, but there are several of them who have quite considerable activity, and these communities of research are the, the vehicles to assist this uh, working together. Six of them, for exposure, ecotoxicity, modeling, risk assessment, databases and ontology, the IT technology that I mentioned earlier, and risk management of control, and if you're interested in this domain, talking with our American friends, not only American, as I said, Canadians, Australians, uh, Chinese, Japanese are already uh, coming together, becoming a global um, cooperation. So then you can link with this website. Uh, here I will not extend too much, but uh, say that the Nano Futures platform is, is a kind of, of, of a template with, for a number of other platforms. Uh, this is um, construction, for example. This is chemistry. This is electronics, photonics, industrial, uh, industrial safety, materials, nano medicine, uh, textile, you see here, factories, on a number of areas. And all this work is expected to come together in, uh, in an umbrella platform, which is called NanoFusions. And with this, I close my talk, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, George. Um, with respect to the time, I think we continue directly with the speakers. Before I will introduce next speaker, uh, I would like to, uh, to inform the uh, audience that uh, for those who are interested, uh, there is a poster board available in, in the registration desk. If somebody is looking for clever PhD students or uh, postdocs and or somebody of young people is interested to apply for, for some uh, uh, nice applications in, in the area of nanotoxicology, it's uh, possible to, uh, to inform via this uh, poster board. So, uh, I would like to uh, now uh, introduce next speaker, which is uh, Phil Rees from Australia, from Australian Pesticide and Veterinary Medicine Authority, and please do your lecture.
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honour for me to, uh, to be invited to speak at this uh, conference. Uh, this is my very first trip to, to Prague, um, and so I'm, I'm very grateful for the conference uh, organising committee for this privilege. I'm also looking very forward to the uh, excellent program that is, that is planned over the next um, couple of days. I was delighted to hear that the uh, Learned Society has taken a, a name change to the Research Infrastructure Quality Nano. It certainly reflects the uh, quality within nano safety research, which is so very important. Every now and again, one has an opportunity and privilege of gaining a helicopter-type overview of the innovation landscape. I'm pleased that the uh, title of my presentation today provides me with that opportunity and, and privilege. It is certainly very nice. I think it's appropriate that I address at the outset um, science research driving innovation and future growth. Um, we've just heard regarding smart growth. Um, smart growth certainly strengthens knowledge and in innovation as drivers of our future growth. I think this graphic displays it fairly nicely. Ongoing, uh, sorry, ongoing improvement to the quality of our education, promoting innovation and knowledge transfer, strengthening the performance of the resource sector, making full use of information and communication technologies, and of course ensuring that innovative ideas can be turned into new products and services that create um, growth and jobs. I'm really referring to the development of a value proposition. And a value proposition encapsulates all of the reasons and motivations that compel, compel a consumer to buy the product of, or service. And irrespective of the invention, the single greatest challenge is in its commercialisation is the development of a value proposition. So to summarise, we need to, to strengthen the uh, knowledge triangle. We need to support the development of these new technologies. And we also need to take care of the uh, demand side of policies with smart regulation, but also with keeping the, the public informed of, of what it is we're doing. We must not lose sight of the fact that, that for every uh, euro spent on invention, there's something like 10 times that spent on developing products and at least 100 times spent successfully selling and distributing that particular product. And I must stress that is best practice. The outline of my presentation is shown up here. Uh, we've, we know that nanotechnology is promise benefits in a wide range of applications from material sciences to healthcare, food, cosmetics, chemicals, information and communication technology and the list goes on. I won't be discussing um, many of those at all. Uh, rather, uh, I'll, I'll be discussing, um, just taking you for a, a fairly quick tour through some of the um, materials, the possibilities to date. I'm also going to address the challenges. Um, and even though the, the challenges can be scientific, political and societal, my comments are going to be addressing just the uh, scientific challenges which are primarily definition, definitional or conceptual in nature. Before I do that, I'd just like to spend one moment just to reassess the, the nanoscale. We have seen this so, so many times. I've tried to take a different um, a p position on this, a different perspective, showing the nanoscale in terms of wavelength of um, uh, ra radiation. So basically this image shows that the visible light has wavelengths ranging from approximately 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. Beyond that we have infrared, and of course, beyond that, we have microwaves and radio waves. The scale does not allow those to be shown on the scale. 
in the foreground, what we have is uh, ultraviolet radiation from about 380 nanometers down to 10 nanometers. And again, not on the scale, we have X-rays and gamma radiation. So where do these common uh, nanomaterials fit in relation to these wavelengths? We see that the uh, liposomes, uh, fullerenes and carbon nanotubes are very much in the um, ultraviolet radiation wavelength group. Others such as dendromas and, and quantum dots are down in this sort of area here. So in fact they, they are in the uh, longer wavelength of, um, of X-rays. Moving on to the possibilities for nanomaterials, this image um, attempts to capture the evolution towards increasingly sophisticated nanomaterials and technologies with time. There are many examples of, of passive and active nanomaterials already on the market, but despite this, there's quite an intensive R&D activity going on at the present time, and so I, I've included those in this particular uh, image. And the five groups of nanomaterials that I'll be discussing are shown here. Passive nanomaterials, active nanomaterials, nanodevices and sensors, robots and, and factories. I've selected nanopesticides as an example of passive nanomaterials. These nanomaterials tend to do one, of, one or more of the following things they can increase the apparent solubility of poorly soluble active ingredients. They protect the active ingredients against premature degradation. And they also uh, allow controlled release um, of, of these uh, agents. So the nanomaterials, uh, sorry, the nano emulsions and the dispersions shown here are uh, associated with higher efficacy, reduced hydrolysis, reduced volatilization of the active ingredient. They also enhance the mobility and the faster degradation by soil microorganisms. A controlled release uh, are represented here by the polymer-based nanomaterials and the uh, porous hollow silica particles. The uh, Polymer-based nanomaterials can control, or the, the rate of release of the active can be adjusted by changing the proportions and molecular weights of the polymers. Um, porous hollow silica particles are used as carriers of, of active ingredients. They obviously shield from ultraviolet, thereby producing some uh, uh, change to the degradation profile, and, and they certainly allow for controlled release. Active nanomaterials are certainly very well uh, represented in, in nanomedicine. Since the emergence of nanotechnology, there's been many attempts to exploit in medicine uh, nanotech to overcome many of the persistent problems in conventional medical treatments. Uh, liposome, liposomes, of course, have been used in drug delivery now for more than a decade. Um, the Magnetic nanoparticles um, are used both to deliver drugs if, if the size of them are 50 nanometers or thereabouts. They're also used for uh, hypothermia. Um, they tend to be the smaller nanoparticles of about 5 nanometers in size. Gold nanoshells have applications in cancer ther therapy with um, um, infrared hypothermia. Dendromas are relatively new in terms of uh, uh, drug delivery, that is. Quantum dots have been used for localization, as you know, and carbon nanotubes are now being used as nano vector systems, and they too can be used in a similar fashion to what um, gold nanoshells are used. Worth saying something more about targeted drug delivery. Uh, this particular image, uh, panel A, oops, sorry about that. Panel A is simply showing a mass of, ch of, of tumour cells with angiogenesis 
uh, formation of new blood cells. Uh, panel B is actually a, a represented a, a nanolipos-liposome. And the, um, the pink bodies are the active ingredients. Basically, if you're standing on the inside looking out, what you see are the uh, polar head groups, which are all the, of, of, of the um, phospholipids, which is all the, the green, uh, the yellow in here, and the sun yellow out here is, is the um, photoreactive lipids. And there's also some hydrophobic pale blue uh, photosynthesizers, and there's also some orange, you may see them just here, which are the uh, hydrophilic photosensitizers. So we have a, a array of uh, uh, laser um, photo-triggering this. Um, basically, the, uh, there's a couple of mechanisms by which this is just uh, the, the membrane here, the bilayer is broken down such that the pink um, payload, drug payload can be uh, released. Uh, nanoclays have a very uh, large number of applications. Um, you may have seen recently um, CSIRO in Australia have a, a product, commercial product now called Foslock, which is for locking up phosphate, um, prevents the blooming of blue-green algae um, in waterways. In fact, it was used in the um, 2000 London Olympic Games for that very purpose. Nanoclays are also used in... Um, for the delivery of agrochemicals. The example shown here is actually a DNA nano uh, biohybrid. What we have is uh, in inorganic um, hosts with the, the two layers, the silver molecules here are magnesium, the light blue molecules are um, aluminium, the hydroxide of course is the oxygen, mo uh, is, is the red and the uh, hydrogen are the uh, small, small blue molecules. So, so basically these uh, have now um, uh, under investigation for the de delivery of, uh, well for gene therapy in fact, um, the DNA can uh, enter cells by phagocytosis, DNA molecules are released um, uh, either um, in the acidic environment of the lysosomes or through reverse ionic exchange within the cellular fluid. Just wanted to touch on um, devices. Uh, the example I've given here is the uh, nano patch. It's actually very tiny, something the size of a uh, postage stamp. has thousands of projections which are dry coated with, with vaccine. Basically the nano patch is applied to the skin to, and, and, and as soon as the uh, vaccine enters the uh, uh, liquid beneath the skin, uh, it, it very quickly um, dissolves, and what we see is this is a, a, a projection here. Uh, these little dots are vaccine being released. They stimulate, I'll just walk you through the sequence here. Basically, the sequence is the uh, antigen-presenting cells in the skin of the um, Langerhan cells, stimulating the um, T cells, the... Um, the T cells then activate these uh, B, uh, B cells, which in turn activate the plasma cells to produce antibodies. We think this is going to be, it's currently under research, um, should be commercially released in five or ten years. We think it's going to be very, very, very uh, important because at the moment there's something like two million people die every year um, from diseases that can be prevented by vaccines. Um, particularly in uh, developing countries. And this sort of technology, um, firstly, it, it, it allows for, well, we, we don't, it doesn't require needles and syringes. It, it um, does away with the need for a cold um, storage chain. And uh, it can obviously be used without very much um, uh, cl clinical experience because you're simply applying a patch to the forearm for a couple of minutes and removing it. I wanted to touch just briefly on, on one particular sensor. Some of you will be aware of um, smart dust. Basically, it's 
a, a wireless sensor network, which is a collection of these very tiny and cheap um, sensor nodes. They can communicate up to a distance of, a, of tens of metres. There's many applications for these, and you've probably read about them. They're used in, um, for example, for fire detection. Um, they're used in animal habitat monitoring. The military use them, for example, um, e even though it's not, not very much in the literature, it is possible to use these particular devices. They're around about the size of a grain of sand, and they can be spread across a, a battlefield such that military are able to watch enemy move across a battlefield um, and they can do that from another country because the, uh, as, as shown here, the um, signal is actually transmitted to a satellite and back to a laptop which can be done basically any, anywhere in the world. Uh, in agriculture what we can do is, is use it in uh, precision agriculture. So for example, this diagram is, is, is meant to sort of show that there could be something going on with this particular patch of a field and that would be um, treated, for example, with, with a pesticide or it may need irrigation. And so there is no need to treat the remainder of the field. This, of course, saves on, uh, well, it saves the farmer costs, but it also saves the environment. Nanorobotics uh, are used in medicine and no doubt you've all read about these. Some appear to be more fanciful than, than others. One such report that I read about recently was uh, the detection, diagnosis and therapy of subclinical bacterial infections in food producing animals. This, is, this has two really major benefits, uh, I should say, should, should it ever come into reality. Uh, one major benefit is the fact that it, it would um, overcome a lot of uh, emergence of antibiotic resistance. Um, extending the effective clinical life of currently available antibiotics. But the second benefit relates to food safety. And of course, if, if less antibiotics go into food producing animals, then uh, our food will be so much the better for it. Uh, the image shown in this particular, on this particular slide is a, a red blood cell, and, and this is a, a uh, nano robot uh, treating a, a cell individually uh, in vivo. Uh, more information is available on, on that particular um, device on, on, on the website, should you need it. In terms of uh, nano factories, it's, it, it would appear at the present time as though much of, much of what is happening with nano factories is going to rely very heavily on our current understanding of molecular biology. The top panels... Um, on, on this particular slide, refer to DNA as a molecular self assembler. So it's not used for the information, but rather as a structural template. Uh, we're looking here at ribosomes and protein synthesis, and again, molecular assembly. And finally, we're looking at the molecular transport in the cytoskeleton and, and uh, the transport of cargo along these. Uh, microtubules is very much like uh, molecular conveyor belts. And at the present time, we're seeing a lot of this type of um, molecular biology being utilised uh, in, in some of these uh, nanofactories. Schematic at the bottom shows cell-free protein-producing gels. It gives some insight into the molecular manufacturing that, that may occur into the future. Basically, the uh, artificial uh, four-armed uh, DNA junctions are shown here, as is the um, genomic DNA fragments uh, shown in, in red. Um, DNA ligase is shown in blue, and it, it forms a gene-containing hydrogel polymer. Uh, these, in turn, are produced in these moulds, which are, are, are shown here. They, in turn, are then taken across into this uh, test tube in this, this particular um, depiction. Uh, things are added, cell extracts are added, such as uh, ribosomes, um, RNA polymerase, and the, the gel functions as a, an in vitro protein 
um, biosynthesis uh, unit. So it's, in a sense, it's very much what you would expect from a food nano factory uh, sometime into the future. I now want to change tack a little bit and just touch on some, um, some, some definitions. You are all familiar with these. They have been, I, I've sourced them from ISO uh, TS 80001. 80, uh, Arguably, the four definitions shown here are probably the key ones that we need to concern ourselves with. I, I, I don't intend going through those because I'm sure you've all seen them uh, previously. It's probably important to point out that there is, there is a lack of consistency across um, uh, in definitions across expert bodies. Uh, for example, the, the ISO uh, 14644-6 from 2007 includes uh, liquids such as droplets and micelles in emulsions. Uh, by contrast, the American Chemistry Council um, exclude uh, micelles and single polymer molecules from their definition. And it, it just highlights the fact that definitions are not consistent across bodies. Also, there is, there's a lot of improvements going on. Uh, it's acknowledged, for example, in health and safety that th there is no um, cutoff at 100 nanometers. And so the science is still, emer is still emerging and so is our uh, capacity to measure and characterize nanomaterials. And as this goes on, we are going to see some of these um, definitions change accordingly. I should point, a, point out also that regulatory agencies don't work entirely by these uh, definitions. Regulatory agencies have legislative um, uh, mandates to discharge and the, the criteria they use for regulating nanomaterials can be uh, in, in, in excess of what we're seeing in some of these definitions. Development of a uh, ontology for nanomaterials is, is a very important goal that ha has yet to be um, attained. And uh, ontology would allow the uniqueness of specific nanomaterials to be established. It would also allow uh, the equivalency of two nanomaterials to be established. A major challenge with trying to establish a, an uh, ontology is the fact that many practition, practitioners from diverse backgrounds would all like to see that their specific requirements included in an ontology. And this presents a tremendous challenge when it comes to trying to develop an ontology for uh, nanomaterials. The uh, characteristics that I've... Apologies. The characteristics that I've shown up here are, are actually taken from um, that produced by a group doing cancer research. Clearly, that sort of approach works fine for, for that particular group of people, but it would not work fine for other, other researchers. Um, so, so some researchers, for example, have uh, proposed that the ontology be developed in terms of the um, biological interaction of nanomaterials. I, I note that there was a workshop in, in Paris in, in 2012 um, organised by the International Council for Science and its committee, and they rec recommended a, a, a two-phase project uh, in terms of developing a, a nanomaterial ontology. Uh, the first phase would determine the requirements for a description system for nanomaterials that takes into account the needs of as many scientific and te technical disciplines and user groups uh, as possible. The second phase would use that information to, to develop a potential list of the minimum characterizations or characteristics, I should say, that meet uh, as many of the requirements as possible. Just make a, a brief comment on, on labeling of uh, consumer products. Uh, consumer products, of course, of things such as food, cosmetics, plant protectants, detergents and textiles. Nano-labelling has been making uh, 
has been the subject of many headlines in the press. Uh, there's always two sides to an argument. Um, con consumers um, require additional information on labels for making informed purchasing decisions. Industry, on the other hand, argue that because nanoparticles are not in principle dangerous by their very nature, undifferentiated labelling could stigmatise and malign nanomaterials in general. And, and it's for that reason that a simple nano label could be interpreted as a warning symbol, while a label with extensive information could lead to over information. There's a situation in Australia in 2012 uh, when Friends of the Earth published a list of sunscreen products which were claimed not to contain any uh, nanoparticles uh, such as uh, UV filters, uh, titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. Tests later showed that these indications were not always reliable and that these uh, alleged nano-free sunscreen products did indeed prove to contain nanomaterials. I'll finish by just mentioning some of the uh, regulatory uh, challenges. I, I, I list them here. I will actually be talking about these on uh, Friday in the regulatory session, so I, I don't plan to go into the, the details now. But uh, it's, it's very heartening to see that the, um, the challenges that I've posed up there are very similar to the list that we saw previously. So uh, when, when we looked at the snapshot of innovation and the regulatory level and some of the items that will be addressed, and certainly there are many items in that regulatory field that will need to be addressed. So in closing, I would like to acknowledge the uh, very significant contribution of Dr. Michelle Nick Reinald, um to the preparation of this presentation. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Phil, for this uh, uh, overview talk and uh, the challenges and the opportunities. Uh, we have now time for questions uh, already now. If there somebody has questions specific about pesticide authority view in Australia, well, uh, or to the talk. Now is your opportunity. I see a question over there. Elise, please present yourself, who you are and where you come from. Uh, I'm Elise Fitzsands. I'm a visiting scientist at the University of Lausanne's Institut Universitaire Romain pour Santé de Travail and also a doctoral candidate at Geneva School of Diplomacy. I'm fascinated by the question of how to define nanoparticles and nanomaterials for regulatory purposes, which often looks very different than the way it looks in the world of the lab bench, for example. And I would like to know what you think of this idea that was launched by the Royal Commission in the UK in 2008, that the key issue is really functionality and not size. And I ask this because I know that a lot of regulators like numbers and think that it's easy that if something fits in a size box, it's one thing you regulate. And if it's too big or too small, you don't, or you don't worry. What do you think of this notion around functionality? Thank you. Thank you for the question. It's, it's a very good question. I, I made the point that regulatory agencies have legislative um, a mandate and legislative criteria that must be satisfied. As, as far as size is concerned, uh, in the agency where I work, for example, we use size for nothing more than it, it's a tick box on the application form. And the purpose of that is to draw our attention to the fact that what is being submitted may, may possibly be a nanomaterial that needs to be um, treated somewhat differently. Ju just because um, the box is ticked 
does not necessarily mean to say that it is between 1 and 100 nanometers. For example, um, the, the differences between using dynamic light scattering and, and um, transmission electron microscopy, for example, can produce very, very different results. Uh, I, I will be showing one of those on, on Friday. But for example, if you were to use TEM, certainly the material would be in the, in the nanoscale. If you use DLS, uh, it would have a size of 300 and something, whatever, nanometers, and it would fall out of the scope. So really, I, I, I believe it's, it's nice to, to know if, it's in, in, if, if the applicant feels it's in the nanoscale to highlight it. Certainly for our reporting, um, our minister, for example, wants to know very, very rapidly, I'm talking about you know, within five minutes, how many um, nano materials could be in the system or could be approved, and so we, we need a database and that sort of information is handy. But, but really it comes down to, uh, as you said, the, the functionality. Re regulators work on, on risk, basically, and risk is a function of hazard and exposure. And it's the hazard part which fits in with the functionality. But of course, it's, it's also the size which um, goes hand in hand with the biodistribution and the systemic exposure. I'm not talking about the exposure to people, which is quite different, where you can wear uh, you know, protective clothing, etc. Um, and so the regulator or must, must do the risk assessment based on on functionality and all those types of things. I, I hope I've answered your question. Are there other questions? Hi, my name is Natasha Lewinsky. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Work and Health in Lausanne. And I have a follow-up question on your comment about saying that when you a size is a tick mark on the form. And so what do you mean when you say that it will be evaluated differently? I'm, I'm referring to the fact that if, if we have knowledge in advance that the material is a nanomaterial, um, we, we, can, we can be aware of that. The evaluation is really no different to what it would be for a conventional chemical. Um, the difference is partly with um, uh, public perception in particular, and we, we don't wish to overlook the fact that a, a nanomaterial was, was evaluated um, from a, a, a public point of view. The risk assessment itself is not necessarily different. Um, I, I, I will be addressing some of that on, on Friday in a regulatory session because, you know, obviously if we're talking about pesticides, for example, we're not just talking about um, the, the chemistry, we're, we're talking about public health and we're talking environmental health. And so there are many, many different issues to take into account. And, you know, some, something as simple as agglomeration could, could change everything. And perhaps what we're dealing with isn't even a nanomaterial. It, 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 may, it may have been produced as a nanomaterial. By the time it's placed in a syringe or into um, a mammal or a plant, it may no longer be a nanomaterial. And so we've got to look at that, the persistence of that characteristic. I hope I've answered that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill for these uh, responses to these answer questions. You will stay here for longer, for the entire week, so there have, are plenty of opportunities where you can learn more about the Australian uh, pesticides and agricultural field, uh, the questions, if you have more questions to him. And especially, uh, he mentioned already the talk that he will give later on, uh, on a more specific issue, uh, less of an overview, but more specific, and that's also something to look forward to. Thank you again, Phil. And those of you attentive to the program, you realized already that we had a 
welcome note missing, which is from the coordinator of QNano. The reason is that Kenneth Dawson was unfortunately on Sunday in an accident and was stuck, uh, if I understand right, the car got fire, he got some burns, but he looked horrible when he joined us by video conference on Monday. I see he's again uh, smiling and happy, but he was unable to travel, but fortunately to the technique, he's now here with us online and uh, ready to give the talk, the keynote, the second keynote lecture. And Kenneth, without any more ado, um, you have the word. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Excellent. That's good. Okay, so as you can see, I'm uh, not as burned as, as, as you might expect. So it's a fairly minor injury to my leg, but it still makes me relatively immobile. So this is really a wonderful opportunity to be able to keep going um, the conference without me actually having to be there. Um, if we look at the title slide, um, I believe Chris is going to change the slides for me. So if anything becomes misaligned, he'll let us know or he'll let me know. But basically, um, in the first slide, there's a question. But actually, much of what I want to say in this talk, it's not really a scientific talk or research talk in the usual sense. It's to sort of talk about our field in a more general sense. And I detect a wind of change. Um, in the last nano safety cluster, but one, that's not the one that you attended yesterday possibly, but the one before, the conversation talked to excellence. It turned to the topic of research excellence. And that, in fact, is the first time that I've heard the community begin to use, use those words. And so the question is whether nano safety research um, will emerge in its maturity, uh, in, as it matures, into a real platform of research excellence globally. Now, it would not be surprising if at least Europeans wished that to be so. It would be quite natural. Um, the reason, of course, is that rightly or wrongly, Europeans are very conservative um, about safety, uh, probably more so than many other parts of the world. And Therefore, it's a topic that's very close to them, close to us. It's therefore, in some sense, natural that if we're going to engage with this topic, that a topic that's so close to our hearts, safety and nano safety in this context, that we should ultimately seek and perhaps grow it into something that is truly scientifically excellent. In the next slide, too, However, there is what we call in English language the fly in the ointment. Now, you'll understand that some of the things that I have to say involve very different views of many different people. Um, and I don't always, I won't always tell you which view I personally sit in, uh, but I will say that if you look at this month's Nature Nano technology magazine, journal, um, you'll see a debate on the quality of nano safety research. And that debate has sort of gone on over several editorials, several letters, with, I suppose, the underlying theme uh, a little bit, that there's something that needs to be done by the nano safety community for it to establish its credentials more clearly. Um, that's a dialogue, by the way. I, I think it would be valuable if, if as the slide suggests um, and the journal suggests, we, we can join this dialogue um, and make our own views felt 
but um, I think most of us accept that there are some concerns about the, the, the status of nano safety research as it began. Now, this in itself, I hasten to add, is not surprising. If you actually take a step back, which I think is very important for everyone to do, that's um, scientists, regulators, policy makers, funding stakeholders, if you take a step back, what we've achieved in a short time was remarkable. We've come together from the four corners of research, so to speak, and begun to make a new field. Uh, we didn't start with a shared language. We certainly didn't start with a shared vision. And those of you that do attend the Nano Safety Cluster, which I strongly recommend, you will see a remarkable growth of convergence in attitude and view. So I, I think we've actually achieved a lot, but it would be wrong to say that we have uh, we reached this status of excellence. But I think now is the time to talk about that word because it's come up, and I'm pretty sure that that's what Europe is expecting from us. And I'm pretty sure that that's what is feasible globally. If we go to the next slide, um, I just want to make a remark, slide three. I mean, uh, I think what we have to really capture is just how different cell nanoparticle interactions are from those of small molecules. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that because I think this question about mechanisms of action being very different um, underlies part of our problems to date and some of the controversies that have gone on in the literature um, so far. If you turn to the next slide, you will see green 40 nanometer as it happens, polystyrene nanoparticles inside a living cell, where the red things are lysosomes. This is uh, 30 minutes after the particles have been exposed to the cells. And I'm showing you this slide and the next one to make a very specific. So if we now turn, uh, as most of you will know, of course, the lysosomes, the red labeled objects are, are the bins of the cell. If you now turn to the next one, four hours later, you will see that the red particles, sorry, the green particles have all vanished. And you will see that those orange objects that you saw are formed by an overlap of the green particles with the red lysosomes. And it's a, it's a very simple point. But the point is this, that uh, those particles were trafficking to the lysosomes. Now, that is not what happens in small molecules. And if you turn to the next slide, there's a very simple set of two pictures that I think uh, all of our students have seen. And I'd recommend that you show something like this to every student that comes to your lab. Simplifying this, somewhat. The left uh, picture is a cell that has been exposed to um, a fluorescent dye associated with, especially composed uh, into nanoparticles. And on the right is the identical dye exposed as a molecular dye. Now you'll see on the left that the green is punctit, and on the, green, on the right the dye is everywhere. Actually, ultimately, it'll associate to different organelles in all sorts of complicated ways. But what you're seeing is the same chemical structure acting in an utterly different way, simply dependent on the size of the object. And actually, that is the same picture de facto that you saw in the movies. Because on the left hand of the picture, those punctate green spots that you see here are actually lysosomes. And it's the same picture as the thing that you saw with the orange, which is the green inside the, the red lysosomes where they were dying. So the key point is that nanoparticles can interact with cells in new ways, 
Um, and unlike small molecules that interact um, by more conventional physiochemical distribution processes, what we have here are active biological transport. Now, if we go to slide seven, what we've just talked about is, is a very important example of how different things are when we're dealing with particles rather than small molecules. And so one of the points I want to make is that some of the practices that we have introduced into our community, sometimes without um, extensive evaluation, um, need to be reconsidered because those practices were designed for small molecules. They were not designed for nanoparticles. And so there are two areas I want to talk around. One is the positive controls, issues of positive controls, and the other is connected to dispersion media. These are not um, the only issues, but they're illustrative. And if you go to the next slide, I'm putting the question to some of the issues that we so that we're talking about impact on the reproducibility of our science. If you then skip quickly past slide nine, which is again this question of reproducibility and so forth, and go to slide 10, you'll see an example of a round robin um, test, set of tests on particles that induce cell death, technically apoptosis. Um, this is part of a little round robin, early stages of development of a round robin led by Inga, who's probably in the room. And you'll see that these are the results from many different very good laboratories. These tests were carried out with a reasonably good SOP. And you can see that with identical particles and identical everything else, the spread of results that have been obtained. Um, now, there is always a tendency um, when we face results like this to respond in different ways. And one of the things, I'd just like to spend a few words on, on how we should react to these results. In some cases, essentially, um, there's a difference of 50% in, in, the, in the numbers of cells that cell die between different laboratories. Um, what we must emphasize is that these are all good laboratories. We must also emphasize that um, that the SOP here, the sort of uh, directions or guidance that the laboratories were given, can certainly still be tightened up a lot. But already, it's much, much stronger than the description that is given in typical experimental, news, uh, experimental papers. I'll just pause and let you reflect for a moment on that. So the kinds of experiments that we're doing and reporting at the literature, in the literature at the minute, typically um, involve less defined controls than the ones carried out here. So of course it would be possible to continue and refine and refine the controls at some length, but the key point I want to make is that we are reporting essentially results of this type in the literature. Um, and you can see the typical spread from lab to lab. It's therefore not surprising that there could be different cons outcomes reported by people. Um, if you go to the next slide, I want to explore for a, li a little bit the kinds of of reasons that cause differences in how we in what we report. <coughs> so
So the first thing I want to discuss is this idea that it comes as a little bit of surprise at first, um, or it did, I think going back several years ago. Cell nanoparticle interactions depend on their context in quite a different way than molecules. So we are accustomed to essentially dissolving small molecules and doing in vitro uh, biological and toxicological experiments with them. But in this case, if you go to the next slide, slide 12, one of the things that we've worked on, um, if you see this nanoparticle is actually covered by um, lots of different biomolecules that it has absorbed from the environment. And um, we've now come to the relatively clear conclusion that the way that nanoparticles interact with um, cells, biological barriers and so forth, is in large measure a consequence of what is absorbed onto them and not only their size or shape. Now, I, I hasten to add, of course, that what is absorbed onto them is a consequence of the material and their size and shape. But you see this phenomenon where the context now becomes part of the experiment. Succinctly put, if you disperse the particles in a particular dispersant, you have given it a context that will affect the outcome. If you choose to use 10% of uh, serum derived from a cow with human cells, you have made a very specific choice. And it might not be the right choice in understanding the outcome. If you want to see a little bit more of this, we have a review in Nature Nano in December um, that you could consult. Now, I won't spend much time on slide 13. It's uh, su sufficient just to say that if you look at the left-hand distribution, that's 100 nanometers polystyrene particles. And then if you expose those particles and spin them down, uh, for example, in human plasma, we dispersed them after six hours the dotted curves are still essentially unchanged. And that, that shift in size turns out to be due to what's absorbed onto the surface. And I show you this only to comment that those particles have been redispersed after they've been spun down, redispersed in PPS. So six hours later, that absorbed layer is, uh, hasn't moved. And if you go to the next, um, slide, that just shows you, I think, what many people already know, that it's easy to strip off those biomolecules that have been absorbed and analyze them. This is now a huge industry, by the way, so I, I don't want to go into details. The real point here is that um, if you actually look at what is absorbed to the surface as a function of, say, serum concentration, uh, then for many particles, what is absorbed changes depending on the concentration of uh, the serum that's been added. And here, here you see very clearly the context dependence of uh, our work. So depending on what you choose to disperse particles in, you'll get quite a different answer. And if you go to slide 15, you'll begin to see that in the upper left picture, this is the kinetics or time resolved picture of the amount of particles, these particular particles, that are taken into the cell as a function of time, with and without serum. And so the next point is pretty clear that um, and by the way, I'm focusing perhaps on very, very simple particles, but what I'm telling you is essentially true of all legacy, so to speak, so to speak 
OECD particles. So there's nothing special about these examples. Um, but this picture shows you very clearly that the amount that is taken into the cells is very dependent on the uh, protein environment, for example. And so the real dose, that is the dose that is experienced intracellularly, if I may use that word, real dose, it is dependent on what you disperse. Now, of course, we know it's also dependent on, for example, the degree of aggregation and things like that. But this is a different subject. This is even if they are well dispersed. You have quite different um, degree of uptake. And furthermore, you can actually look at the paper listed on the lower left. But you look at these two images on the lower right of slide 15, you will see that this is an example of silica um, with 549 cells. Again, the details are not particularly important. But you'll see that in the absence of serum and in the presence um, of sufficient serum, sufficient being um, a, a, a topic to which I'll return in a moment, not only do you get different uptakes, but you get different biology. And actually, those of you that have studied um, freshly prepared silica, in the absence of serum at sufficient concentrations, will have recognized, I think, a level of cell death. Now, the reason for this has got nothing to do with the silica, except nothing to do with the silica in a proper physical um, presentation. The, the, the cause of it is actually um, on the next slide, but I won't go into details. And probably we don't even really need to look at that slide. We could go directly to slide 17. Um, what we did in this case is, is interrogate the particles that had been exposed to cells, where indeed they caused degree of cell death in this case. And we found that possibly what should have been expected is that because particles typically have a very high avidity to take things from their environment, if you don't give them something that is reasonable, they'll take something else. And in this case, they've taken part of the cells. It's as simple as that. Um, and so if you like this corona that these particles form in the end, if you didn't give them enough serum, enough serum, they actually form a corona from the cells themselves. And that induces a fascinating cascade of biology none of which we think is likely to be relevant in realistic situations. Um, if you look at slide 18, I think it's sufficient for me to say that I think Chris is probably showing you these slides. And he has a talk on Friday. And I think it would be better to attend his talk if you want to see more details about that. Um, and then slide 19, I think, again, is something that you will be well aware of, or so many will be, that um, whatever kind of charges and so forth that one starts with, for example, these are aminated nanoparticles. Uh, when their particles are in the presence of proteins, they essentially that... Um, zeta potential or those exposed charges. In this case, usually we have something called overcompensation. So the sign of the charge actually reverses. And uh, so there's very little relationship between um, between the bare particle and the particle in this context. And slide 20 shows you in this particular case that the degree of cell permeability or cell damage of these aminated particles depends essentially on the protein environment that we present to it. Now, if we go to slide 17, I'd just like to... What? We 
we've discussed. And do that, I'd, I'd ask you to take a step back with me for a moment and ask how we got Why in in vitro experiments do we add 10% serum, for example? And the answer is very simple, to feed the cells. It's as simple as that. The second question is, why do we add, add fecal calf serum? And the answer is very simple because it's cheap. And I use this as an example to show the dangers of importing without critical evaluation practices that have been taking place for many years successfully in in vitro toxicology. I think we need to beware of getting anything we want to get. I think if you think through what we've just discussed, you'll actually see the basis of a lot of disputes in the literature. You'll see the possibility, the potential for some people to find biological interactions, toxicity, and so forth, and others not to find, where in fact nobody is wrong. But perhaps really went wrong in this scenario if we didn't think deeply enough about how to recreate in vitro experiments and make more closely the in vivo situation. In practice, it's hard to imagine that nanoparticles could ever present themselves to organisms or most parts of an organism unless they are in excess of a biological milieu fully covered. And most of these damage scenarios that I showed you, uh, I think, are just not realistic. If we go to the next slide, I think um, <laughs> I've left this anonymous. Some of you may know uh, who said this. Um, I think it's true, but it's not exactly um, a desirable uh, reflection on us. And I want to discuss this issue as a second example of things that we need to look at. So if we go to the next slide, just remind us what a, a positive and negative control would look like in this particular context. So let's say that someone wanted to study in vitro um, apoptosis. In most experiments, we would use uh, a positive control that we would know induces apoptosis, a negative one that we knows we know does not, and we would show our experiments racketed by the positive control and the negative control, and people trust us because they also use the same positive control and the same negative control. In the case of apoptosis, it's in chemicals, often star sperm, and if we get the same result as the other person gets with star sporin, there's no reason to distrust us. Now, um, the question is, uh, do we have positive controls? And I think if you go to slide 24, the bottom line is no. Now, I want you to work with me a little bit on this one because this is a delicate point. Of course, you can, if you're studying apoptosis, you f can for sure, and you should, use star sperm as a control. But the question is whether it is a positive control for your study, which is nanoparticle-induced apoptosis. And there I want to um, explore this issue of mode of action. And what really <coughs> underlies positive control deeply is the hope that your positive control has a similar mode of action. In other words, if it acts completely differently um, to your experiment, it essentially just says that you're able to do this experiment of stars born. 
It says nothing about whether your system is positively controlled by that mode of action. If you go to slide 25, I won't spend much time on this, but suffice to say that um, in the particles that we've been developing and looking at for apoptosis positive control, for example, there's a very clear mode of action that is in no way related, I think just skip slide 26 as well, that is in no way related to um, a chemical mode of action for apoptosis. And if you go to 27, furthermore, you will also see that in this particular case, um, positive controls are also affected again, as you might expect, by, for example, the amount of serum. And, in other words, how we present positive control. Again, this doesn't happen with stars born. In this particular case, we find that uh, proteins that are derived from the environment are carried into the cell, and the particles act like a Trojan horse, for example. And they don't cause damage where you would expect them to, but in this more realistic environment, they reach new places in the cell where they then induce damage, they then induce another kind of signaling cascade, and that produces a very distinctive mode of action. And we can just think skip also slide 28, but just to um, pass through it at least, you can actually follow in these experiments the evolving location of the particles, the corona, that is the adsorbed proteins, um, their locations and the ultimate outcomes. These, uh, much of this work is published. And uh, also Anna Salvati, who's probably close by, uh, can tell you a lot about this, this work. So coming now to slide 29, um, I suppose I showed you that because it justifies why we've been working so hard within Quality Nano to produce positive controls. And I think those of you that are closely associated with the program will know that we're trying to develop and roll out positive controls one by one for all the different endpoints. And we started with uh, apoptosis. It's, it's the most trivial one. Um, and we've, we're launching that at this meeting. And we hope to develop that over the coming months and make it available to all of the partners in Quality Nano and then beyond. Now, I don't have time. I have to uh, draw my uh, talk to a close, so I don't have time to uh, go into this whole question in detail. But suffice to say that there are various workshops going on around the meeting, connected to round robins, positive controls, and so forth. They have been announced and probably will be announced again. And I, I really would urge you to go to those meetings and get into all of this in more detail. We think it's important. And um, the, the other point I think I would like to make is that I don't want to leave you with the impression, for example, in the positive controls issue, that this is an easy or a completed task. Um, small details of the nanoparticle synthesis can still leave us with a different biological outcome and so we still have these problems with batch-to-batch sort of -batch or reproducibility and many others. But still, please go to those workshops. Let's go to the last slide. Um, and I suppose that's really, if you want to forget all I've just said and remember a few simple points, these are they. Um, obviously, we in Quality Nano are committed to making this field work. We are committed to defending it, developing it, and explaining it to everyone, not just science, but ourselves, but also to policymakers, regulators, and funders. Now, I think my own personal belief is that there is a wind of change in this community. What started out as a loose and, and 
unstructured assembly of people is now beginning to converge to a very clear vision of itself. And I believe that that vision of itself will include uh, the desire to be seen by the rest of the church as just as good as you are. And increasingly, we'll wish face to face with the rest of the scientific community compete with that for the best places in peer recognition. Now, the other area I think that's changing is that nanosafety research has recognized, I think, its broader role. And um, I think it is seeking to govern itself. And I think that what's happening at this meeting uh, is, in fact, an example of it seeking to govern itself. And in the editorial of Nature Nano, at the end, I think there's a very interesting statement. It says that this whole topic of quality that they're worried about will be discussed in Prague, which it is being, and that they will look forward to hearing the outcome. And so I think the outcome of this discussion will partly be determined by what you think. The last message I want to leave you with is that, as I said, this program uh, is seeking to support these two objectives. And, and it's open, and we want you to join us. And if you go to the last slide, that's just a tribute to some of the people that have been involved. And also, I would add to that, because I think it's an opportune moment, um, a tribute to my young colleague, Dr. Isolt Lindt, who I'm happy to announce has uh, been uh, appointed in the senior position in the University of Birmingham. Uh, and uh, I'd like to pay tribute to all that she's been to us. And I'd also like to say that we expect the uh, average IQ in the University of Birmingham to increase by 50% at the end of the month. Now, I recognize in saying that, that that'll probably be the last time I'll ever be invited to the University of Birmingham. But nevertheless, the uh, mission of Quality Nano is to tell the truth. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kenneth, for this talk, which was very well audible, and also the scientific uh, message was clear, I think. I'm sure there are many questions. Please wait until you have the microphone so that he can hear it well. There's one over there. And Michael, again, state who you are. My name is Hans Power from KIT Karlsruhe. Can you hear me, Kenneth? I can, but... Uh Go ahead and, and speak, Hans Parr. It's not quite as clear as Michael was. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for pointing out the pitfalls of dosing of nanoparticles to cells. As you said, it's important to control the context when you do this. However, I have not really heard the cure. How would you control the context of a specific cell which have the specific protein content. Don't you have to avoid uh, the, the medium completely? Um, I think I, I try to answer the question I think you asked, Hans Bar, and uh, stop me if I got, heard the wrong question. I, I think the sense of your question was, should we leave out the medium? Uh, because otherwise we can't control things. And actually, Paradoxically, what I was trying to explain that in these cases, and in fact in most, if you leave out the medium, uh, you get the worst possible scenario. Um, there is a very important uh, distinction that occurs when the medium is present. Um, in the case I showed you of silica, essentially the, the very high energy of the surface of the particles damages the surface of the cells, and the particles gain entry to the cell by a damage mechanism. They then go to different and uh, interesting places, but as soon as you have um, enough uh, serum pre present in the medium, then you revert to conventional biological processes. Now let me deal with this question of what is enough. The reason I say enough is that if you add a very small amount, 
uh, and it's small and large, by the way, is of course determined by the surface area of the sample of the nanoparticles, obviously. So a small surface area of nanoparticles uh, needs a smaller amount of serum and so on and so forth. But if you, if you add um, insufficient amount or zero, you have these damaged processes that lead to nanoparticle imprints. Beyond a certain amount, you revert to a fairly conventional biological process. And at that point, um, at least you're back in the ball game. You're no longer going to produce silly results, where it's actually the high surface energy of the particle simply damaging the surface of the cell. At that stage, you come into another level of questions, which is what kinds of, of mediums should you have added? And of course, we do know a lot more about that now, but that's a much more sophisticated question. Succinctly put, you should try to match the medium with the biological target. Um, we shouldn't be using uh, FCS with human cells. We should be using human serum with human cells. Does that answer your question? Is that, did I understand your question, Hans Park? Hmm. Thank you for that question. Are there other questions? Um, I ask the people who have the question to come forward to this microphone, please. Um, maybe you can, it's better if you come to this microphone so that he can understand as well. And other questions that have questions to speed up a bit the uh, uh, pause between the different questions that they come and line up already behind. Or at the microphone, okay. then everybody can hear you. Uh, Massimo Massarini from University of Milano. And I can. Uh, I, I appreciated very much your talk, and uh, uh, I'm going directly to the to the question. I completely agree with you of the need to having positive or negative controls, uh, and uh, just uh, going directly to the, your example, that one of apoptosis. Uh, I agree with you that you need positive controls, and that these controls are very importantly uh, to be chosen because they need to work and to have the same mechanism of action. Absolutely. Okay. Now I'm, I'm forgetting to be a nano-medical uh, scientist and to be originally a biochemist. And uh, as, uh, as far as I can tell, the mechanism to induce apoptosis in a cell are many, many, many. Means that you can uh, act on the respiratory chain, you can act on the uh, lipids of the mitochondria, you can induce, uh, you can induce the, uh, oxidative uh, reactions and, and produce uh, this, this kind of, of uh, oxidations. Then you can uh, activate caspases, you can uh, work on the, the distribution of lipids on the, on the, on the surface, like phosphatidylserine and so on. So, uh, what I am worried, uh, how is it possible, but I agree with you, to have so many different nanoparticles uh, that act on these different, many different uh, pathways of the, of the uh, apoptosis? That's, uh, by the way, firstly, let me thank the person who oriented the camera, because I can now see you. Thank you for your question. It's it's really penetrating question, and it allows us to go to another level in the discussion. You're absolutely right. Um, in fact, it's clear by the very virtue of the very arguments that we've both made that a positive control that does not touch the same mechanisms <laughs> is not a positive control for the study that you undertake. Therefore, in principle, we will need a different positive control for every nanoparticle-induced process that we find. Now, it's of interest 
to note that so far, to my knowledge, the, uh, the categories of nanoparticle-induced apoptosis are quite small. I won't go into the details of what they are, but the varieties of them have been quite small. Um, unlike so far, um, the broader range of apoptotic mechanisms. Now, let me carefully resolve what I mean by that. One does see in these, uh, for example, crosstalk apoptosis processes, many uh, simultaneous uh, parts of the pathway opening up, but they all start from a common source and a simple single mechanism. Uh, and, and we can go into that another time if you like. So my uh, belief at the minute is that what we've seen so far in these pathways is that for nanoparticles, one by one as we've looked at them, there is a, a catalog of mechanisms and that indeed it is not as broad a catalog yet as we have seen in chemicals. Um, but each time we find a new one in the catalog, we will indeed have to find another positive control. That's it. You're right. I think it's doable, though. I don't think that there are, our experience, at least so far, is that um, you know, nanoparticles tend to act in a, in a more narrow axis of uh, mechanism. Okay. Thank you. Kenneth, there's one more question. Uh, Bengt, if you get over there and you can, Kenneth can see you. Okay, thank you, Kenneth, for a wonderful uh, uh, presentation. Um, just, again, to the point of positive controls, I mean, how can we know the mechanism before we conduct the experiment? So, so are we not, in fact, talking about reference materials rather than positive controls? That's, that's one, one remark. The, the other is that I would, uh, to some extent, of course, I do agree with the previous uh, 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 colleague who posed the question that and, and, and stated that there are many pathways to induce apoptosis. At, 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 on the other hand, uh, the program does converge on common pathways. So I would argue that starosporin could be a positive control, if indeed by positive control we mean that we want to control the assay itself. But if we want to understand mechanisms, that, that's another question. And, 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 and again, uh, coming back to my first point, uh, are we not, in fact, talking about the need for reference materials in the field of nanotoxicology? Uh, very interesting question. Um, I mean, maybe let me try to interpret the question. Um, in a sense, positive control might be an earlier stage of uh, scientific exploration. So you might say that once you've sort of understood what the mechanism is, um, is it any longer a positive control? But is it really just a reference material? I think the three, the last two questions and what we're discussing here, they'll probably converge to much the same uh, issues. And I don't want to um, take the position that, um, that this is resolved. But what I stated before is that we have the feeling that there are bands of mechanisms, packages of pathways, and that these pathways are nanoparticle induced, and that many nanoparticles that induce that pheno general phenomenon act by a similar mode of action. Um, in this case, for example, lysosomal damage lies at the heart of it. Um, lysosomal damage of a certain type lies at the heart of it. And so it's possible ar along those lines to actually, uh, in, to actually have, if you like, a positive control for lysosomal damage. Whether we call them positive controls or reference materials, um, I'm not sure if that's important. But what will be important is that people that, want that study um, apoptosis of this general class 
or cell cycle arrest of the classes that are now emerging and all of the other mechanisms, that we do have some means of exchanging acts of trust between us and the lab. Whether we call them positive controls or reference materials, I don't know. But I also want to re-stress that this is far from a finished concept. Nor are these materials in any way complete. What I'm arguing in a sense is to go back to that anonymous quotation. Nano safety is uh, one of the few areas of modern science that lacks common use of a positive or negative control. And I don't think that we can afford to wait any longer to take action. So let's at least go closer to a situation where we do have positive and negative controls. Let's see them in the literature where they are imperfect or imprecise or they don't mimic closely enough the mechanism, let's say so. But let's, let's get the process moving. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Kenneth, for these uh, um, responses to the different questions. I think you had a very uh, interesting discussion afterwards. And uh, with this, uh, I would like to thank you again for having joined us uh, via camera. The quality of sound and video was excellent. And uh, after all this discussion on positive and negative control particles, we should not forget that uh, Q-nano, or quality nano as it's called now, is also a lot about transnational access. We have the best facilities across Europe providing their lab space uh, through these TA access uh, funding opportunities. So you can access, you can deposit your request to access those facilities and if you get grant, a grant, you have free travel, free housing and free access and on-site uh, support for running your additional research questions that you have. And I want to raise your attention to the TA clinic tomorrow at, uh, in the afternoon, but don't just trust for that TA clinic, it might be busy, you might not get enough time. So con check outside on the counter the, the flyers, the handouts on what TA possibilities exist. Contact QNano staff to direct you to the right people to discuss what do these facilities offer, what are possibilities and ha get our help in writing a good grant application for this TA, TA access. We had in the past a lot of rejection rates and many of them, we think, were good science, but not sufficiently well packaged. And it's just a shame if, if we reject your proposal just because we didn't get your idea. And with this last part, again, thank you to all the speakers of this session. And uh, our coffee break goes until 11.30, and we start in here at 11.30. And thanks so far for this good timing. and off for coffee break. Thanks, Kenneth. So, it's uh, the microphone is right here, so... Kenneth, you have to check. You have to make sure that you get uh, this one. Yes, yes, I support the building, so forward. <laughs> 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 <laughs>